being treated as an equal is great if you are an equal. So we have got to discuss how we take this blanket off of us. Whenever there has been a poll that asks the American people if the people who live in the nation's capital should have the same rights as others, there is a overwhelming resounding yes. No matter how you look at it, this is one of those upward climbs if you're willing to climb with us. I've about, I about done as much as I can think of as a member of Congress. We have a record number who have signed on to the statehood bill, more than ever. We have a record number of members of the House, more than ever before, who have signed on to the statehood bill. Co-sponsors, this time in the House, instead of co-sponsoring the bill and asking, uh, as I usually do in a, in a bill I put in afterwards for people to be co-sponsors, I ask people to be co-sponsors with me. By the way, on, on the Senate, both when, when they were in power last session and this session, we not only had a record number of Senate sponsors, but the entire Democratic leadership of the Senate. I have to conclude that our problem was not in, not in the Congress. We know our problem is with the Republicans and not with the Democrats. And by the way, it used to be the opposite. The Democrats were the Dixiecrats who kept us from moving forward. And they got religion, I don't know, sometime around the 1960s and the roles reversed. We have a clean appropriation from the Republican Appropriation Committee. Now, I can tell you that those two very conservative appropriators, the one in the, the subcommittee and the full committee, would vote for statehood. But I can tell you that they handed us the same clean appropriation that the Democrats do. There is some sense in the Congress that there is great injustice being done here. And while some of them are willing to get, stand up and say, give them statehood, you can, you can see that feeling with very conservative members. They wanted them to attack, for example, what they passed in the House, a bill to take all the guns, gun laws, a uh, bill to take away two council bills. Those did not happen in the Republican Senate. And yet we have, and I'm grateful to have uh, district residents come and help us. They go around to get signatures or to get people to sign on to bills. That is marvelous to have. It's a good organizing tactic. But I want us to face today uh, what it takes to get a movement that is part of a problem that is 225 years old. First, to get a real movement in the city, instead of the people who carry this load, they are extraordinary. Uh, one of them is a speaker here today, a state, state representative. How can we, we, we have such a movement in the city that it's echoed uh, around the country so that we can move more people on the hill to do the right thing because that is the way it comes. It comes from there to here, not the other way around. On eight, when HBO did last week tonight with Tom Oliver, I tell you, we can't pay, we couldn't pay for that. If we divided it up into pieces and kept tweeting parts of it around on the social media, no, I don't know if everybody is organized to do that. It is a priceless piece. Uh, for anybody who has movement. So today we want to just get people's ideas. We want to hear from some who have been working on issues, issues 
that we know resonate around uh, the country. And the theory is if these issues around, uh, resonate around the country, uh, is there some way for people to know that those issues are related to statehood? Marijuana, the majority of the American people believe that people should not be arrested for smoking, small, for having small amounts of marijuana. We're one of the most progressive jurisdictions to do that. This has become a movement. I have allies in the, in, in the house who are working with me on it. Guns. Every time you have one of these big flare-ups, if they knew that they want to take all of our gun laws, and we related it to that, that would be something that's happening in the country that's also related to statehood. Frankly, I throw these things out and literally use the word throw, because I don't have any answers. All I know is the greatest frustration is nobody knows but us, and that we don't have a, uh, a huge movement even in the city, even though you can't find anybody uh, in the District of Columbia who's not for statehood. How can we make that resonate louder so that it gets picked up everywhere? So I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna start with our council member, David Grasso. You know. We often focus on the things that are most frustrating, so I'm gonna mention one victory that just came up last night in an event that I was at. Uh, when we were on, when I was uh, working for Congresswoman Norton, the Democrats were in control of the House and the Senate uh, for those two years. And uh, Representative uh, Serrano from New York was the head of our Appropriations Subcommittee. And he uh, saw that uh, the right thing to do would be to defend the District of Columbia and the people of the District of Columbia and took the riders off of the budget. And uh, one of those riders that he got to take off was the, riot, uh, the ban on spending money on needle exchange programs in the District of Columbia. And last night I got to hear a lecture on health in the district and the future of the fight against the spread of HIV in the district. And that is a paramount moment in the fight. The, the, prior to that, every year we had 145 to 160 people who were intravenous drug users being newly infected with HIV. And now it's down to less than 10 people per year because of this program directly. So it's a really amazing amazing thing, and I think uh, he deserves a lot of credit for that, along with Congressman Norton and the other Dems in the House and the Senate at the time. Uh, you know, I'm in a new position now, though, as the uh, at-large member from the District of Columbia, uh, also an independent in the D.C. Council, and I immediately saw a role that I could play in the two and a half years ago when I took office, and uh, that was to be a little bit of an agitator in this area, because um, I think that for too long in the Council, we haven't uh, stood up for our rights to the fullest extent that we can. And I think that at some point or another, you have to say, uh, these are the rights that I want, this is the rights that I deserve, and this is what I'm going to do to represent the people that I represent. And uh, I represent all 650,000 D.C. residents, and so uh, when it came time for a government shutdown two and a half years ago, um, you know, I said, no, I don't think we should comply. And it was an interesting conversation because uh, there was a lot of fear, uh, you know, around what would happen with that, and it was uh, opened up the conversation to a new level, and ultimately the Mayor Gray at the time, I think, did the right thing. Uh, but he, I, I must say, went one step uh, beyond what I would have done. He actually did send a plan to OMB, to the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, the plan was that everybody was essential, and I think that was fair, and it allowed us to move forward, and I'm not criticizing that. But if we want to get national attention, and indeed international attention on these issues, I think we have to put our necks on the line a little bit more uh, and actually say, no, we're not going to send you a plan. We don't have to send you a plan and see what flies from there. Now, I know that's kind of a risky thing to say, and I know that uh, I can't expect everyone to go along with me on that, uh, but at least if you have one voice in the council, and that large member is willing to say that, um, I've said it also in the way that I do my legislating. I have, uh, put uh, two bills before the government that uh, both uh, Congress has had to act on, and I, I appreciate the Congresswoman's strong work on this because um, they, uh, they have uh, tried to shut down a couple in, of my bills and they were successful in one but not in the other. And I think the Reproductive Health Non-Discrimination Act that I passed 
which protects a woman's right to choose um, regardless of what her employer says and protects her from discrimination in that effort is extremely important and uh, we were able to fight back on that one, weren't we, Congresswoman? And uh, now it's effectively in law in D.C. Uh, that a woman in a, in, in, a, in a job can go out and choose whatever reproductive health decisions she wants to make. Um, she has to pay for it herself. We're not mandating that businesses have to pay for it, uh, but they're not allowed to then discriminate against her. Um, the other uh, bill that I've been fighting hard for is really a criminal justice matter for me and has expanded more and more, but uh, the question around legalization and tax and regulation of marijuana. Um, the uh, council has worked hard on this issue. The mayor and everyone has now agreed that it's the best way to go forward. Uh, we did, as you know, a referendum and the people stepped up and, and voted uh, overwhelmingly to support this. And so I put in my bill again. I put it in in September of 2013 to tax and regulate marijuana. And I did it because uh, the ACLU and the Washington Lawyers Committee pointed out to us quite uh, blatantly that uh, it was a bad policy and that the war on drugs doesn't work because it unfairly discriminates against African Americans. And 91% of everyone arrested in the District of Columbia for marijuana offenses were African Americans. So uh, to me, it was an injustice that needed to be stopped. I did not think that, and I still don't believe that, decriminalization of it is going to solve the problem. I think we need to regulate it, and I think that's something that I'll continue to fight for and stand up for. Unfortunately, Andy Harris uh, stepped up and got in the way, and I think ultimately uh, it wasn't about marijuana that got that on there. It was about the fact that there was another budget shutdown, um, and they needed to make sure they had the votes in place to keep the government open for that period of time. Uh, my hope is that this year we'll, we'll get that off of there, and we can move forward, like Congresswoman said, with a clean appropriation for the District of Columbia and move to a place where we can actually go ahead and do what's right here and tax and regulate marijuana. Um, Congresswoman, I could go on and on. Uh, you know, these things around, um, you know, immigration law and guns and women's rights are things that are extremely important to me. And I'm going to at least commit uh, in my small role as an at-large member of the council to continue to stand up every single day and do what I think is best uh, for the people of the District of Columbia, for the voting members of the district, for the people that serve in wars and pay federal taxes. Uh, that's who I represent. And so uh, they're going to be the first thing in my mind, not whether or not Congress is going to be upset with whether or not I do something. So uh, that's my style. That's what I'm going to continue to do. And I, I, I know uh, well that uh, when I do that, I know you have my back up on the hill and that all of you out here and all of the statehood folks are engaged in that effort and, and trying to fight for D.C. every single day. I think that when we have two senators and a, me a member of Congress that can vote in the House, we will be successful and that means that uh, statehood is really what we need to fight for and I'm going to continue to do that as long as I'm uh, living uh, in this great city, the District of Columbia. Thank you, Congressman. The delegation does not have official recognition in the Congress but they do official work for us, and very, very, uh, we're very grateful for the work they do for us. Yeah, uh, Representative Garcia. Um, and so, what I wanted to, to say is a little bit about uh, where this uh, residents of the city have the rights without statehood. And, and I believe the short answer is no. And, 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 but, 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 you know, what we know about that is that we, throughout history, have tried to change uh, uh, the plight of our city, the, the lack of congressional representation, and everything that comes with not being a state. If you recall back in 1978, we actually tried to amend the Constitution, and uh, fortunately, it failed to get three-fourths vote. I think we, we ended up getting 16 states to actually ratify, uh, and so we needed 38. And, and so the current approach that we're uh, using now, that of uh, dividing the current territory known as the nation's capital into two parts uh, is the way to go because that's the way that you ensure that Congress is not, as, as uh, Article 1, Section 8 says, that is under the control, that the federal enclave, you know, being the nation's capital, is not always under the, the federal, uh, the, the, the Congress, the control of the Congress of the United States. And so that's what we work for. Um, the good thing about, I think, whenever you hear uh, Congress uh, stepping in is that it gets certain parts of our city excited and involved. And so we saw that with the marijuana issue, which I think you'll hear a lot about today, where uh, back in 1998, you know, we addressed our issue because uh, one time we, we had the highest numbers per capita of, of people incarcerated due to, to 
to, to, to marijuana. And so we addressed it here locally, and, and the Congress said, no, you can't do it. But the, the people, the citizens of the city said, no, we're going to go ahead and take all this. And then they realized that statehood is important for them because it means that they're protecting their right to, to, to determine their own laws. And so it's the same thing happened, uh, as Councilmember Grosso explained, uh, with the uh, Reproductive Health Non-Discrimination Act, right? Which actually, that one actually made it to the House, uh, House vote, uh, uh, but never made it any further than that. Thank God, because it is a cumbersome process to get the, the Congress to actually stop our laws, even though they can do it, right, if, if they want to. And, and, and in the, the HIV crisis we had, you know, we knew how to, how to address our issues back when we had that crisis with the needle exchange program, and that, you know, also was a, a mess, uh, having the Congress be part of that. Um, the sanctuary, sanctuary City is also another uh, situation where we've seen uh, Louis uh, Gover from uh, Public of Texas recently wanted to do something about that, and it's all related to Donald Trump going all over and saying what he's saying about immigrants and the black people. And so we can see that when we get people um, when we touch on certain segments of our community, of our city, we get people excited and we get them involved. And that's the good thing that comes out of this because it is about getting more people involved. Uh, you know, it, this can't be, as the Congressman said, about just a few elected officials. It has to be everybody involved. And I think that as the city changes and we inform and engage more people in the process, I think we will achieve uh, statehood. Um, and you know, it's interesting that we're talking right now about, right, this moment right now, um, or ironic about uh, voting rights for the city and statehood, because this is the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, in fact, I was marching yesterday with the, with the Justice March, uh, and being my members of Sierra Club, we talk about the VRA in passing, but I had every member that I talked to go into the Congress offices and talk about full statehood for Washington, D.C. organization for Washington. You know, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, in a sense of, you know, not as a resident, I think mean, everyone knows that, uh, but, you know, as a business person. But I do want to take a quick show of hands. How many people that uh, are in the crowd that aren't from, uh, don't live here in Washington, D.C.? Okay. All right. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Um, so, I'm particularly pain uh, speaking to you, because the ones who live here have to live this every day. Uh, and we need to help with those who don't live here. So uh, talk to their friends and family, talk to their members of Congress uh, uh, about equal uh, rights for Washington, D.C., the residents of Washington, D.C. Um, so just, you know, as you know, you know, governments uh, uh, establish new rules and regulations that guide businesses. And changes in those practices affect, uh, affect businesses, whether profitability, and I've got to change my practices uh, depending upon uh, what the regulations are, whether it's national government, state, you know, or local. So I just want to talk about a few policies that affect, you know, me as a business in the fact that Washington, D.C. does not have full control uh, to make and implement policies uh, that can impact me as a small business. Now, we always think of government as a catalyst. You know, uh, local, state and local government can invest in infrastructure improvements to support small business sectors, to, or, or corridors, but in order to do that, they need revenue. You know, and like most places, you know, DC gets the majority of its revenue from taxes, uh, both from businesses and individuals. Um, uh, but we're limited uh, in that revenue that we can generate uh, because, unlike 41 other states, um, we can't uh, issue a tax on individuals who work in the city uh, or don't live in the city. Um, there are estimates that uh, between 530 million to 1.4 billion dollars uh, DC loses because they don't have access uh, to that revenue stream. What do you do with that? For me, as a small business, you can invest in infrastructure improvements like transportation, uh, uh, whether you talk about metro, uh, uh, bike sharing, uh, whether you talk about uh, buses, you know, allowing more people to come to my place of business don't live, I have a business in the 14th Street corner, who don't live uh, in the surrounding environment of my, business, my two businesses. Uh, they can make improvements to the, uh, the quality of our water system. We just got notices that our water bill, whether you're a business or a resident, are going to go up. You know, D.C. has an aging uh, infrastructure in terms of our water system. But 
the city's kind of hands are and what they can do to help support that. Uh, because of revenue, they have to make, you know, uh, Councilmember Grasso has to make decisions when they're voting on our, on our budget and priorities. Um, you know, they can invest in, in schools and housing, schools, to help educate and improve the quality of the workforce in the city as needed to solve those who tap into housing. So I can keep uh, uh, those individuals in, in my neighborhood who come to frequent my businesses you know, every day and they don't move away because of whether the school system isn't great for them or that the price of their homes have gone up or the property tax has gone up as we try to uh, increase revenue to keep up to do the business of the city. Second area is interest rates. Um, you know, um, you know, rising interest rates affect me as a business uh, in terms of how I have access to capital. You know, higher rates leads to, you know, kind of decreased consuming. You know, one of the things that uh, is interesting, and people don't actually follow, you know, most people follow the, the DC's bond rate is, I do, uh, because, I do because, you know, when uh, Council Member Russell and his, his fellow Council Members and their past budget has to go to Congress for approval. Sometimes, and oftentimes, that happens after October, um, after bond rates are set. Higher bond rates means higher rates for me, uh, and limits my ability to access to capital. That can make improvements in my business, uh, or even think about expanding. You know, um, and Congressman Grasso talked about you know, safety. You know, uh, uh, my many hats at war, I used to be in the gun safety movement for a long, long time, trying to improve the laws here. Um, you know, D.C. should have the right, like Maryland and Virginia, uh, the elected officials there, or Texas, you think of uh, Congressman Gomer, to establish what the, what the laws and regulations are in the city. Um, I am a gun control advocate. I want to keep guns uh, out of my place of business. And I don't want the Congress to mess with the laws in D.C. about where uh, my council members uh, and my, uh, my mayor has decided where you can bring your gun. Uh, despite what the Supreme Court says, the Supreme Court people interpret their, their decision about the right to bear arms, uh, state and local governments can pass laws to restrict where those arms are being carried at. And then finally, we talk about social policies, and, and both uh, Councilman Norton and uh, Councilman McGrath have talked about the two, well at least one of them, the, uh, the non-discrimination acts that were passed by the city council and signed by the mayor, the Reproductive Non-Discrimination Amendment, as well as the Human Rights Amendment, that both prevented discrimination treatment of, employee, of both employees and students at this uh, Columbia. You know, Councilman Norton talked about uh, the press conference being at my place of business. One of the reasons was at my place of business is because I help organize local small businesses uh, to speak out there. Because I should not uh, have an impact uh, on where or how my employees seek to seek their reproductive health uh, uh, measures or healthcare in general. And, I, and healthcare is a very important issue to me because uh, uh, I am actually on the um, executive board of the DC Health Exchange uh, and help write the laws and write it and, and put laws in place to help reduce the cost of healthcare and the access to healthcare, increase access, access to healthcare you know, here in the city. And I point that out because um, the DC Health Exchange uh, isn't impacted by Congress uh, in, in a large degree. And so we've reduced, we've increased the number of people who have access to health care and reduced the amount of people who, uh, who, uh, who are uninsured in the city. And we did that because Congress was not in our way. And that's what we're speaking to, whether as a resident uh, or a small businessman, let the individuals who we've duly elected to our, uh, our offices um, set policies and regulations um, for the citizens of this city and for the business of the city. For any business wants stability, uh, to be able to figure out, predict in the future, uh, you know, how am I going to grow and stay in business? And oftentimes, uh, uh, what happens with Congress is unpredictable in terms of our budget uh, and regulations we put in place, and whether or not the city can spend funds uh, to implement some of the regulations they put in place. Um, That's unpredictability for me that I don't want, both as a resident and I don't want as a small business. So, uh, for those of you who are residents here in DC, I will fight with you tooth and nail. Uh, to hopefully see in the near future we get um, home, the true home rule and become a, a state. Uh, and those of you who don't live in the city, go and talk to your family. Uh, the district has one of the best bond ratings in the country. You have a surplus. The reason you don't have a AAA bond rating is because your appropriation has to come to the hill. That's what Wall Street tells us. 
and you got two people that have to pass it, automatically, you do not get the AAA that, that Virginia, they don't have the surplus we have. Maryland, they don't have the surplus we have. So we suffer financially as well. Uh, and and it, it's little factoids like this that we need to spread out, we need to tweet out. Um, um, I think you also mentioned another bill of the, of the council that they tried to overturn the Human Rights Amendment Act. And that, that was the council's uh, wisdom in overturning a really ancient who was put on that thing around those state economies. I work for Dr. Brothers Magic Soaps, and the company doesn't advertise. Uh, we have a zero advertising budget, but we do give away millions of dollars a year now to all kinds of causes, and increasingly DC statehood is uh, okay to help out, at least my time. And um, Dr. Bronner's gave $100,000 to the initiative campaign here, but uh, two-thirds of the money came from local residents, so they were just sort of the seed money. Um, I want to talk about like some movements first before I get into my main remarks. Uh, the Arab Spring, does anyone know how it all started? It was a shopkeeper who was disrespected and it, it just triggered all the protests in Tunisia and spread across the Middle East. Um, Occupy started with just a handful of activists in Zuccotti Park who said that Wall Street's out of control. And we're seeing now the impact of Occupy play out with the rise of Bernie Sanders and other anti-corporate candidates in this presidential election cycle. Black Lives Matter, I know this audience knows how that got started. Police violence, targeting African-American communities. But what about D.C. statehood? Where is our spark? I know a few weeks back, uh, Congresswoman was convinced that the John Oliver piece was the spark. And I agree, it's the greatest <coughs> video ever done that sums up our, our cause. But, you know, I got two students called me up and said, we're mobilized, we're ready, we, we are so fired up after seeing that John Oliver piece. We never really put it in perspective. These are lifelong, these are and um, we ended up organizing a beach party in uh, at Ocean City in Amy Harris's district. Um, sort of last minute, it's hard to organize in August, but we did something, we started than sitting on our hands. We raised this no taxation flag uh, on the beach. Where you see, and, you know, 5,000 leaflets were put in storefronts across the boardwalk, and the, and the residents and the storefront owners were actually very, very sympathetic to what we're saying, and that is call Amy Harris, tell them, hands off DC's budget. Um, but we still haven't had our kind of Arab Spring Occupy Black Lives Matter spark for this movement. And I hope it happens soon. And I'm constantly trying to make that spark happen, uh, basically on a monthly basis. Uh, but once a month trying to do something for statehood with just my friends, just people in, a, in my immediate circle of community that I, you know, we can do this because we like spending time together um, I see many of these activists in the room right now. Um, now let's talk about the marijuana initiative. We had to ignore Congress. Like straight up, I was being told by the city council, you cannot pass legalization here, Congress will overturn it. I kept hearing that in 2012, 2013. And I said, well, let's let them overturn it. If they, if they, if we pass it, and the voters approve it, and they overturn it, that's gonna be the spark for the statehood movement. That's gonna bring people out of the streets who didn't even care about marijuana, they care about democracy. And so it's a win-win for us. We can't lose, we just have to do it. And uh, you know, simultaneously the DC Council passed decriminalization, which made it a $25 fine. And while that was a noble effort, and it did reduce the vast majority of, of arrests uh, to no, to maybe 90% of the arrests were eliminated, um, it's still treated us like second class. And we don't treat wine drinkers and beer drinkers like second class. And we, and we don't want to treat any group like Please second class. Please come in and have a seat. There are plenty of seats now. So, um, have you know, so we, we would say ignore Congress and really we had to ignore what the city council was saying for the most part. Because they were telling us to be satisfied with equalization. We collected 57,000 signatures in nine weeks, which everyone said was impossible to do, and we did it. We did mostly uh, with paid signature collectors, but we also were getting people into politics for the first time. We hired dozens of district residents who never worked in politics in their lives to collect these signatures, and they became political advocates of their own. They realized that politics pays, and it was a good experience to pay people. We also got a lot of volunteers. We collected almost 20,000 of those signatures from volunteers. Um, 
So it passed by 70%. I'm just going to fast forward because it's an additional time. And uh, it looked like Congress was going to overturn it. It really did. And I was like, fine, we'll turn this, we're going to put everything in the statehood now. We'll put all of our energy, our entire listserv, all of our volunteers, it's all got to go to statehood. And uh, fortunately, because of this budget dispute, it, they just dragged out the clock. And I think we slipped in our law like nine days before uh, this rider went into effect that, was, that would have prevented us from passing any new laws about marijuana. And right now, uh, Councilman Grosso can't get his law passed to tax and regulate marijuana in a reasonable way uh, because Congress is uh, preventing him from doing that. I hope you will. I hope you introduce legislation and you ignore them and do it anyway. Okay. You did, I mean, yes. yeah. We have it, but we tried to have a hearing and we couldn't. Because so. at some point, um, you call it law. Are they really going to prosecute you for doing your job, for legislating? And so that was kind of our approach. Is they really, are they really going to overturn the will of 70% of the voters? Well, they didn't. But then this year, in January, it looked like they might do it with the new Republican Congress coming in. We built a liberty poll. Uh, some of you might have been there. But if you got to look into, deep into American history, that the American Revolution was started with liberty polls. Basically, ship masks with a red hat on top. We built it in front of the Capitol at 4 in the morning, 4.20 in the morning. Um, we weren't noticed by the police for two full hours. We had a bonfire, and we had about 30 people. Two people were locked to the pole with steel uh, like cuffs around this big, thick pole. There's no way they're getting pulled down. And um, if you look on the seal of the U.S. Army, if you look on the seal of the U.S. Senate, you'll see the Liberty Pole. It's actually on those government seals. But nobody knows the symbol. So we brought it back because we wanted to use kind of the Tea Party messaging, you know? Uh, like, we, we felt like, you know, if it was too long, the Republicans have been stealing this freedom and liberty message. And what about D.C.? Where's our freedom? Where's our liberty? Right. So we started using the Tea Party messaging. And um, uh, we started to visit out-of-state folks, uh, like Jason Chavis. We went to his office with a peace pipe. Yeah. And he said, look, you know, we're tired of you. Uh, he's the overlord. He chairs the oversight committee for D.C. He, he's trying to overturn the, uh, this marijuana law and our abortion laws. Other things. So by presenting him a peace pipe, dressed in colonial clothing, a uh, dozen of us made a lot of headlines, including in his district. Okay. And that's the trick here. We have to shame these guys in their own district. They don't really care what D.C. people think about them. They do care what their own constituents think about them. And so I, we have to travel more, you know? We need a big budget to travel. We don't have a big budget to travel. Uh, but that's, that's what's on my mind, is to travel more. Uh, lastly, you know, the marijuana issue is a civil rights issue. Um, this is a special audience. I'm, I feel very privileged to be here today. Uh, I was telling my family about this for weeks. I can't believe I'm speaking at the Congressional Black Caucus. This is like a big deal. Because in 2013, actually it was in 2012, I was on the Kojo Nambi show talk about drones and about my lost drone. And I said, you know, I really want to talk about marijuana. I don't want to talk about lost drones. Because marijuana is a civil rights issue. And I was, man, Kojo and Tom Sherwood, who's a local NBC guy, they jumped all over me. They said, it is not a civil rights issue. I think a lot of women would disagree that abortion is a bigger issue than marijuana. And I, I said, well, you know, are any, is anyone going to jail for abortion? Are we locking up women for having abortions? No, we're not. And what we do, we're locking up 700,000 people a year for marijuana in this country. And if you don't think that's a civil rights issue, then I guess you've lost the whole meaning of what civil rights is. Because when you're in jail, you have no civil rights. And I've been in jail 17 times, mostly by choice. <laughs> a couple times, though, not by choice. And one of the times was a marijuana-related charge. And I looked around the room, and everybody was black, except for me. Like, it's like 50 people in the holding cell, the big holding cell. I was the only white guy. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? Why are you here? Marijuana. Why are you here? Marijuana. Then later on, you know, realizing that you go to the courthouse and 50% of the cases are marijuana. And it's the same way right now in Maryland and in Virginia. And I got a call this morning from a guy who just got busted for growing six plants in Virginia. I said, well, you know, you're not part of DC. It's not legal to do that. And you're probably, you're, you were guilty and you're screwed. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'll wrap up my remarks by saying that um, the best activism is fun. We did our liberty poll for six full days. We did not leave that poll on the mall. We had someone there at all times. And dozens and dozens of DC residents kept that poll going. And uh, it was like a, it was a place to gather and talk about DC statehood. Many people in this room came. We did the poll again during Pride Week in the DuPont Circle for I think 36 hours it was set up. 
And then just this past month, I took the poll to Burning Man in the middle of the Nevada desert. And we talked to people about DC statehood at this crazy alternative festival. People from all over the world there. And it's really, you know, naked people running around. But they were getting the message. <laughs> in fact, we stood out because we were like the only political people there. Everyone's talking about art and stuff and we're talking politics. And we were really interesting to these people. And people had no idea that Washington, D.C. didn't have representation. And um, we also, people say black people don't go to Burning Man. Well, we were the black people. I'm not black, but our, <laughs> many of our crew was black. And, and they were like, yeah, this is a civil rights issue. So I just want to end by saying that um, we, have, we have to keep fighting. We can't get discouraged. We kind of have to laugh off things that don't go well and really celebrate the things that do go well and just and stay positive because a lot of people got burned out in this movement in the 80s and they're no longer active. People got burned out in the 90s, they're no longer active. And the same thing happened last decade. But everyone's going to come back to it and just, you know, keep, you know, not get discouraged, pace yourself. And uh, but I, so I try to do something once a month, and I think that we all can do that. If we just try to say once a month. We'll do it, it, don't be old school. Don't go back to the movement uh, that I was a part of. Where in order to get people in the movement, you had to really go around and organize and have people. You still have to organize. Ask Black Lives Matter. How do they get people on a corner? Just by tweeting, be there at a certain time. And what they have done is foment a revolution against the oldest civil rights issue in the United States, police brutality. That everybody, they got the President of the United States appointing a whole 21st century policing commission and, and a whole bunch of the power structures used to call it. Looking at an issue was silent. And it was not done by old fashioned organizing, it was done by 21st century organizing, which does tell us that there's a lot in our hands uh, that we're not using. Uh, um, Adam has, has, has talked about, they have given you terrific examples. But I'd like to go back to last week tonight. Um, this is a city full of tech geniuses, lots of high tech people live here. They work here, sometimes they work for the federal government, but they're people who know everything about technology. Uh, it breaks my heart that last week tonight is lying on the table, waiting for somebody to organize around it, the way the Black Lives Matter took one police shooting and organized around it, and somehow the other day there are Black Lives Matters all across the United States. But it can't be done unless there's somebody, it doesn't have to be full time, simply committed to taking apart, it's in the public domain, uh, this um, hilarious, the best way to get a, a rise out of the Congress, make them look like the, the dunces they are, make the whole country laugh at it. Um, Indeed, while well, I have um, uh, the, the state of the delegation here and the council member here, I think the council could even hire somebody to take this thing apart and three times a week tweet out various parts of it so that this does not lie fallow. We don't have a lot to work with, but when we get something to work with, it seems to me we, we've got to make the most of it. Not everybody is like Adam, who when he has nothing to work with, just makes something up, <laughs> like, like Liberty Pole. So what I'm trying to do is to get you to think about what kinds of things we can do to get a rise first out of DC residents, uh, uh, beyond those who are carrying this burden. It's a small group relative. I had a business with a uh, dozen employees who were rated and uh, when employees were arrested, I was arrested, and we had a year of legal troubles. That what eventually... kind of business, Adam? Well, we're back in business now. Um, it was a retail store called Capital Hemp, raided in 2011. It was very popular with two stores. It was all because of alleged uh, drug paraphernalia charges. Anyway, what I'm getting at is that we were actually were following the law, and now that we're reopened, it just seems totally silly that all this revenue was lost to the city, people lost their jobs, we were getting bankrupted, 
you know, it was a waste of everyone's time. We're denying young people opportunities to create new businesses, and these businesses probably would be minority-owned businesses. They became states because one was Democratic and one was Republican. Never in the history of the United States, this is a barrier we have to get over, never in the history of the United States has a state become a state without it being a wash. We even tried it for the voting rights bill, where we got Utah and D.C., and there is so much animus and bias against D.C. that even when we found a friendly Republican, who by the way took the initiative on this, we still could not get it. Do not overestimate what it will take to get statehood for the District of Columbia, and I hope we will pour all of these ideas into the basket uh, until using them all, we become the 51st state. We have, we, we've got some of those senators on our statehood bill because they don't have to face this issue yet. But that's dollars and cents to them. The reason I don't even raise it now is I want to get as far as we can get. Then you want to stop us then, then the burden is on you. But it's a very important question to anticipate that it's not going to be the same way it was for, for Alaska and Hawaii. Mr. McCoy, thank you for your question. I think also, in addition, we have some experience with this. Uh, when I worked with the Congresswoman, we were moving forward for a markup with budget autonomy and legislative autonomy. And that was the first time that we saw a tremendous amount of effort around poison pills on, the, on those bills. If you remember, that was when we first saw the gun issues and other issues like that. Uh, I remember we were in a Transportation and Environment Committee markup, and the staff from the Government uh, Oversight and Reform Committee came running over to get us. If you remember that, Congresswoman, and we came running over because uh, we were shocked to see they were starting to just pile on these amendments. And, and what will happen is, uh, I, 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 you know, I hope it doesn't happen. I hope we have enough energy before that. But what that will be the, the method they'll probably use is uh, poison pill, ride on amendments that make it very hard for people to then continue to support it, um, which, uh, you know, what they would look like. I mean, there's the same old uh, hot button issues that we've dealt with forever. Uh, but I think the Congresswoman makes a great point. If we can get to the point where the folks are accepting of this more, uh, then we'll have more defense. And of course, we always need a strong president uh, to back us up uh, down the long road uh, to make sure that the president makes it a priority. And that's what we really need to continue to push. Don't let these barriers at all get them. Just put them out of your mind. Remember how long it took women to get the vote? You know, it was white women I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and, you know, they didn't want to slept with white men. They didn't want to get birth to white men. You know, they had to chain themselves to the White House gates. They were in Lawton. That's how they got the vote in recent history. So they didn't think about all the barriers leading up to it. Things change. And while it's important to raise things so people don't think there's a magic going on here, things change. What is it we're doing now? Since it's going to be an uphill battle, how far up the hill are we? Is the question we have to ask us. That's what's on us. One of the things in, in uh, Detroit and in Michigan is that a lot of these people are opening up and these empty buildings and cutting them out and making marijuana shops. Now, they're paying taxes, uh, they're paying utility bills, and they're not a church. But uh, what I would like to say is that um, what you have to do is put pressure on your member. You employ the elected officials. So the employees got to hear from their employers, whether it be ballot initiatives, uh, whatever, it's opening up business. So um, whatever we can do in the city of Detroit, to free the weed for the jobs we need, because that's our mind. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, listen to the people, don't pay attention to the numbers that they try to use to shut them down. Uh, all I want to say is that it creates not only just marijuana smoke, but industrial hemp. That's the mail plan that you can't get high from, but you can make over 25,000 products from it, starting with drywall for uh, homes, 
and cement the road. So and some of us are on a bill in the Congress to get them off of that, so they can, so hemp cannot be illegal. And put them, I don't know what the reason for that one is. We we are we look. They're gonna put us out of this room. Uh, we were supposed to be out at five five o'clock. It's five ten, but I'm gonna hear everyone who is up there now and thank you for for remaining to ask the question.